Ken and Dr. Nicole back again for another live chat. Today we are talking about um, part one of Vanishing Half, The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. Um, pretty good book. Have you finished it? Not yet. Um, I'm on the, I think it's part four. So I've gotten to that. Um, okay. It's a lot. So, <laughs> a lot going yeah. on. So. It's a, it's. I read um her other book, the, the Mothers, earlier this year. So it was was it last year? I don't know, but it was. It's it's pretty good. This one, both of them, honestly, are kind of like it's a lot going on. But um, part one is covers chapters one through six. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I got my syllabus up. Um, if you haven't already purchased your syllabus, they are on sale now, I think for $4.99. So you can get Vanishing Half um, and Search of Our Mother's Garden and all of the other syllabi that we have curated this year for $4.99. Not sure how long they'll be $4.99, so go ahead and get them while you can at that price. But let's um, go ahead and get into the discussion. So I'll kick it off. Okay. Miller, Louisiana is a farm town founded by light skin black by a light skinned black man exclusively for other light skinned black people. So um what do you the question of the service is what do you think it says about the town, its founders, and present day, which in the context of the novel was uh nineteen sixty-eight. But what do you think? Of, what do you think it says about the town, its founders, and present-day occupants that it was specifically created for light-skinned black people and has throughout throughout time remained for a light-skinned black people? Um. So I would say, like to me, it's uh, extremely interesting, given that it's in Louisiana, where like we know. There's like this history of um, kind of colorism and um, large communities of um, light skinned folk. So, <laughs> um, and I think it's a sign of the times then mm -hmm. um, that uh, in the South and really like the deep South, there's this like, um, need to, I guess, or want to um, be separatist in that way. Um, and I just keep thinking of um, just like what was happening in other areas at that time, because it was like the black, like black is beautiful, black arts movement. So there was mm -hmm. like, um, like in Northern, like uh, the Northern, United States, it was a completely different um, mentality um, in various cities. So I, those are the things that I'm, I'm thinking about, but these things still exist. So <laughs> like, I think, I think this was, yeah. I that was like the main thing that I, I had to tell myself initially. I was like, because I think in a way I almost read it as like fantasy, but I immediately was like, no, like this is Louisiana. This is like two parts of the South. This is like how they existed in the past and now, especially like when you think of cities like New Orleans, they have a very unique relationship to race when it comes to like the Creole heritage and just various ethnicities intermingling and everything. It's not unheard of and it's still very much so same and people who I know people from New Orleans who any other part of the world we would look at them and say they are white you know that is a white woman that is a white man but within their hometown they to, to the people around them they're black and that has never been questioned it has never been for a debate in any way they they're just a, you know there's a multitude of ways to be black to look black but I think within the context of this story with having um 
a, a light skin, a town for light skin people, by light skin people. It's like, okay, who who was who was surrounding you? You keeping? Are you was this only to keep white people out? Was it to keep dark skin black people out too? So you know that was the initial thing. I mean, we we know the answer to that, but it's it's just it's interesting how they kind of. I don't. Did it ever give the the founder of the city's name? I can't remember. But it's just interesting how he um kind of placed himself in a very weird place in this like stratification of race and skin tone that we yeah. still see. Yeah. Um. I think it did. It it talked about. I don't know. If, I think it did name. Um the the founder and it was the grandfather of the twins i believe or the great grandfather of the twins okay um, so um i don't know like yeah okay. uh, somebody said it's a weird safe space <laughs> oh we have no comments on and oh yeah yeah so a weird space um, somewhere in the earlier chapters, the obsession of skin tone speaks to their thoughts about the residents outside of Mallard that possess the darker complexion as a Negro's Negro. So I don't know, like it's just um, extremely, it is interesting that they, they like fostered and nurtured community that was specifically for light skinned people. Um, and now I think when we think of Louisiana in certain areas within Louisiana, that's what we think of. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> so um I said that they feel like um Britt intentionally named one of the families the Lawsons. Yeah. Yeah. Oh somebody so someone said great grand and then someone else said great 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 grand. So, okay. so somewhere <laughs> in the family line. <laughs> Lineage. <laughs> Um, <laughs> like, so I don't know who they were escaping from, but, um, and, in the, I don't know, the interesting thing for me was that, like, when we look at history, um, you see other communities of color forming, uh, for themselves or black communities forming for themselves. And there wasn't necessarily a need to be all light skin or one like complexion. Um, but yet in this area, there was. So, um, kind of like, what would that, what would that look like today, like in 2020? If there was like a, a town that, I mean, because of course we could say that, you know, there are neighborhoods, and obviously there are like all white neighborhoods and neighborhoods that are predominantly black, but what would it look like for a town to kind of like market itself? as a space that is exclusively for light-skinned black people well i think it would be like a problem but like, <laughs> like i think that would be like, I even, I could, a little insane a little bit like yeah like let's uh break down the real reason why you think you need to examine little community mm -hmm. but i mean this exists in other ways so not just you know, yeah. uh, right, color, things like that. So, yeah. Um, so someone said, Yes, though. So, oh, Reed Kicker, yes, those so multi generational mixed families that seem to still have wealth all these years later, and they still have wealth. So, it's still, it's still happening. It is. I do believe, like, those things, like, it's. And we'll talk about this later, but it's deeply tied into like economic status, socioeconomic status as well. Um, it's kind of difficult to like break them apart or analyze them separately because they were, I mean, when you um, attempt to create like your own space, you had to have some economic power in order to do that at that time, so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and then somebody else said, when you asked that question in the syllabus, I had to go back and reread it because I didn't realize that Mallard was intentionally built for light skinned people. 
Definitely. Yeah, food, 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 I mean, I think for me, like it just confused them. <laughs> it's like they're great, like they're they come from these their ancestors founded this town. And so you would think that there would be some uh like celebrity or status in that, but yet when their father dies, right, they lose they lose that status. Mm -hmm. uh, and confusion in that, like they want to leave, they want to leave, they don't want to be there. So, um, well, like one at first is like okay with existing in that space, and, mm -hmm. but I think it made them want to search for more, like feel, like explore what else can exist um, outside of uh, Mallard. So. I don't know. What what about you? Yeah, I think um it's interesting because it reminds me of how you know the conversation about how like um a father, say like a father is an alcoholic and he has two sons and one son becomes an alcoholic and his excuse is, Oh, I'm like my dad, and then the other son is I don't want to be an alcoholic because I saw my dad and just their decisions that that old you know, story or whatever, but it kind of reminded me of that in the sense that they both took these very different routes, but kind of for the same reasons. Like you said, they essentially, they both decided to leave, but upon leaving, they have very different um, lives based on what they had experienced um, during, their, during their youth. Yeah. And I think it was interesting that Stella, who didn't necessarily want to leave at first, is the one that like and like essentially like really changes her life to become mm -hmm. like a completely different person. Um yeah. so I don't know, like I I kind it reminds me too of like just people in general who like their whole families have stayed and areas, certain cities and done certain things and they like follow along the same line. And then there's one or two other people who like decide to leave and move far away or, you know, uh, like pursue other careers and go to school or different things like that. So mm -hmm. um, it reminds me of that as well. Mm -hmm. so. Um, so the third one was, what does the depiction of Mallard tell readers about home, belonging, and community? <laughs> I wrote this question. I don't even know how to answer it. Um, because <laughs> I think just the idea of home is like a recurring theme throughout, you know, in the, in the vanish, in the vanishing gap, but it's kind of like, I guess this is, it would be easier to answer this like at the end, once you know, you have the finale. But so far, I think home space is kind of depicted as a very off-putting type of community. But that's 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 to, that's to me, because um, I know I'm talking about home space in other books. For I, talk, I talked about it before with, um, like a raisin in the sun. And I feel like it's, it's it's evident there what home looks like, what home is. But here it's like home is not a safe space. It's somewhere that people are not, there are people are actively being excluded from, or there's just like this division. You think about how um, Desiree's daughter is treated later on. Like there's there's a really weird relationship with what home is and who defines home and who's excluded from home and allowed to have home, have home space here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Um, yeah, and I feel like it seems like home is contingent and belonging is contingent on certain things. Mm -hmm. So if you belong at one time, it doesn't mean that you will always belong there. So yeah. if you yeah. uh, get in a relationship with, uh, like, obviously, according to look like a dark skin man, like, mm -hmm. mm, you don't really belong, but we just want to see what you're doing and what you're about. And why do you have this dark skin daughter? Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. so, um, I just feel like belongingness and home are dependent on their actions and like what elders in the community see as like right. Yeah. Um, so um, they are definitely trying to figure out what home is physically as well as mentally and emotionally. Mm -hmm. And someone else said it's all it's like they're all running from home, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, want to go to the next question? Yeah. So Desiree is described as the fidgety twin, and Stella as the smart, careful girl. How do you believe that this would potentially play out? as the novel progresses, considering the fact that they're both light-skinned black girls and consider the power relationship dynamics, friendship circles, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to compartmentalize and think like part one, cause it's kind of like, uh, you know, they play out, but it's like, hmm. I said, we figure out, we find out how things play out. But I think Stella, the smart, careful girl, right? Like it, it shows like she was very strategic. Yes. She's like, giving and, like white woman lifetime movie energy <laughs> throughout the novel. Like, <laughs> so she, she lived up. They both, I feel like they she both kind of up. Up. So she made it so she couldn't be fine. Right. <laughs> Very strategic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lifetime movie vibes. <laughs> they live up to, the, to what they to the um characteristics that they are kind of described as, you know, they are put into these boxes outside of their skin tone. Um because you know they act a certain way, you know, they have these personality differences. So they 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 live up, they live up to it. Stella is so creepy to me like she was like i couldn't imagine like seeing this i want to see this in like they're, they're adapting this into a film and i I need to see it i need to see um quincy jones white daughter play stella <laughs> well i was looking at the facebook post leading up to the discussion and somebody talks about tia and samira <laughs> Well, I mean, that's not their last name anymore, but like, and who would play which uh, character, I guess, in it. And so, um, yeah, it's it's very interesting. And mm -hmm. I feel like deep down inside, Desiree wanted to leave because it was like, she didn't have any autonomy. However, like that doesn't mean that she wanted to even pass. Like maybe that wasn't even any something that she really wanted to happen. Um, maybe that was all, all Stella. You know, maybe um, Desiree was cool with her blackness. Mm -hmm. um, so, and like maybe she was just really inquisitive about dark skinned black folks. Like, why is it such an issue that I? like date them, that I be around them, that we live with them, that we mm -hmm. birth them, like, you know, so, yeah, I don't know, but, and thinking about relationship dynamics and friendship circles, I just see Desiree as the one, like, hanging out, like, for example, like, if it were today, maybe, like, she would be part of a Black student union or something, like, yeah. <laughs> it were by yeah. yeah, like, uh, it was, what's the, what's the movie? Movie? Huh? I said, it's a movie. What's the show? Uh, Dear Black People. Dear Black People. 
Yeah, they're white people. Like she would be the the lead character. Yeah, that would be her. so. Yeah, that, uh, like it would be. It's so like it's so cliche, but you have the one daughter who like she's like, why don't they want me around the the, the negro, the real negroes? And she goes to the BSU meetings and she ooh. starts to wear her dashiki and her her Afro puff. And then the other the other sister is trying to like. Being the being theater and you know it's, <laughs> it's pretty evident like how this is how this is gonna play out. Yeah, let's see. You want to say that they don't think Desiree even considered living life as passing? Yeah. Um. Hmm. Someone said that they empathize with Stella. Can you honestly say that if you had the opportunity to take advantage of white supremacy, you wouldn't? It's hard being black now. I can't imagine what it was like in the 50s. Mm. No, so no way. I appreciate her choosing herself. Yeah. That's very interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. Well, I can't. I mean, like, so obviously I'm a light skinned uh, black woman. So, and I have family members, actually aunts who pat, like they're still one who's still passing in California. Like, mm -hmm. so like, no, I would not, I wouldn't be anything other than who I am. So like, I can't imagine passing. Like, I don't, I don't think, no, I mean, I hope it works for Stella, but. <laughs> Apparently, it got her somewhere. So. It, yeah, she got a little, little, little white man and her daughter. Yeah, fur coats, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, after Stella leaves Desiree alone in Louisiana, Desiree moves to Washington D.C. and begins working as an FBI fingerprint analyst using scientific methods to identify people through physical and genetic details. What does the speci the specificity of this career choice add to your understanding of her identity? It's just, it kind of, this part made me think about like black ex exceptionalism because we got to the point where Desiree has decided to basically engage in all things like black, black, you know? So she's like, she, she married this dark skinned man um, she has this dark skinned daughter. She's not passing. Well, not, you know, actively, like intentionally passing. But I feel like, you know, how we have those moments as Black people where we try to, I was like, really play up on our accomplishments and on the different things that we do in order to appear or to appease people, I guess you could say. And I was just like, this is such a specific career that just seems like it comes with a lot of training, a lot of dedication. And I feel like it was very intentional for Bennett, for Britt Bennett to um, include this career choice because it, it positions Desiree alongside the, the darker skinned black people that she has decided to kind of to, to hang out with. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the fact that she can be accepted into the FBI, right? Like mm -hmm. at that time, right? Um, yeah, it's very specific, and so it is like demonstrating that career-wise, she can sort of navigate this world, whereas perhaps others could never do that. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but I also think, I mean, I really like the question because I think it's telling of her just trying to explore who she is, you know, like sometimes we do things like we go into careers because we have a personal interest in like ex exploring, you know, like, you know, whatever that aspect of our lives is. Mm -hmm. So. And I think it speaks to like her wanting to know more um, and to really understand human existence. Like a fingerprint is like, and then also the fact that she's a twin, perhaps she, she's like searching, like that can't be, cause she could have just wrote this book about Desiree 
by ourselves mm-hmm. <laughs> or Stella by herself. Mm-hmm. But instead, it, like she is a twin. So perhaps like the whole fingerprint, the whole like that position is like a fingerprint is different. Twins, like that's not a, a thing when it comes to fingerprints. So mm-hmm. like it's exploring her individuality. It's a way of like seeing differences even within sameness. So I don't know. It was like that's a deep question for me. <laughs> yeah, it could be a, it could be a lot of things. I was just kind of reading I was like, this is such a specific career choice. Um, she could have, you know, she could have been like, oh, and then Stella became, I mean, Desiree became an RN. You know, it's because, you know, we have a very strong population of black nurses and it kind of just would have, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure I would have just read over it then. But I was like, why it's so specific? Yeah, it is very specific, so. Okay. Oh, we have some. Let me see. Someone said, I thought it was due to her simply being a woman. (laughs) I don't know. Her job role didn't really seem to fit my perception of her character. It doesn't appear to be a career that fits her personality as it's described. No, I saw it. So like, even if we go back to the last question, like the fidgety twin. So like the one who's just like always thinking of things, exploring, wanting to know more. I think it it kind of fits. Like if you're doing this job, you're, you're like exploring our scientific realities and backgrounds. And Mm -hmm. uh, so it like connects with this, like always wanting to know more and see what's out there. Instead mm-hmm. of staying within, so it's also um, interesting because um you know Stella was the the smart twin and she's um now she's really only dedicated to finding new ways to really bask in her whiteness mm-hmm. and meanwhile her sister has taken a job that I'm pretty sure is pretty you know critical. Desiree was. Assumed to be the more ambitious and intelligent twin with her interest, talent, interest in talent and math. They took spatial intelligence, similar to the skills that Desiree used in math to be good at the fingerprinting career. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that her character comes off as flighty in her life choices, but her career choice will make her seem as if she's someone that is highly focused. Yeah. But, and it's like, don't we, I think as a society, we just have a tendency, like, when people are exploratory or like trying to figure out who they are individually, individually, we look at them as if they're flighty, like, oh, here she go again. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? But like the reality is that they're just taking their time with it, trying to explore yeah. different options. Yeah. Uh, so at first look, she looks like perhaps, what is she doing now? Like, where is she gonna go? Why is she trying to leave? Uh, just stay behind at <laughs> in Mallard, mm-hmm. you know, with people, um, and do what's expected. But like, instead, you know, ultimately we get her side of like really understanding herself a little bit more. So, mm-hmm. okay, how does witnessing the brutal murder? of their father inform both Stella and Desiree's understanding of race and racism. And then at the end of this novel, this question should be discussed again once everything is kind of brought full circle. Um, I'm blanking. Their, di- their dad was murdered in like, it was a hate crime, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm trying to remember, it's been a couple of weeks. But basically, I just I think that I mean that just gave them insight into the reality of the world that they were living in. And again, this just like if you just read a summary of this book, it it is easy to I think understand it to be like oh, it almost sounds like they like they live in a fantasy world. You know, this town is so far off, and then you read it. And, um, they have really, they've isolated themselves from everyone else, from white people, dark skin, black people, other people of color. And then their father is, he's murdered. 
Yeah. Like, I can't remember all that. He's light skinned just like them. So mm -hmm. he's light skinned just like them. Yeah. So mm -hmm. again, that's confusing. So, like, because they're in this town that creates this facade that if you're this complexion, you're better than um, nothing, nothing will happen if you stay in this town, right? Like, but like, but again, race doesn't matter. You're still black. So, <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that was a, a wake up call, at least for Desiree. Um, it was definitely a, a, a moment of truth because of, you can, you know, within, within your race, you can create all these divisions and systems of stratification you want, but and you step outside of that. And yes, like, you know, colorism plays a part in like, even with, you know, with white people, but I think that this this was just like you said a reminder that you're still black, mm -hmm. and um, it was a it was a very gruesome reminder of yeah. that. Okay, you want to take the next one? Mm -hmm. Um. So, assess Stella and Desiree's relationship with their mother Adele. How does their relationship with their mother eventually inform their method? of mothering their young daughters. They, well, I mean, okay, Adele first. <laughs> um, I mean, their relationship with their mother was kind of, I don't wanna say uneventful or anything. It was very mundane in a sense. Um, I feel like it, it it lacked it lacked a lot in, in a lot of areas, and um, I think that it for Stella and for Stella and Desiree that would that I think she kind of assessed the, the the pieces that she was missing or felt like she was missing in her and um what's her daughter named Jude they mm -hmm. seem to have a really strong relationship a really close bond and then Stella. On the other hand, kind of cultivated this relationship with her daughter that was centered around appearance. Um, even you know her daughter was white, and she knew her daughter would be white and be able to just live as a white girl, white woman. But the way the town kind of cultivated this um, reliance on skin tone and appearance—that's what Stella and still into her daughter and their relationship was very just there was there was no like substance to it there was a disconnect her daughter was almost just another piece of this puzzle that she was creating to etch out this new identity she wasn't actually someone that you know stella was holding close you know i think she she yeah. loved her daughter but i think that it really boiled down to her daughter just kind of being another way for her to play up on her whiteness. So I I see, I don't know, like I, so not really thinking of Stella, cause I do feel like, so I wish there was more written into a relationship that for us to know about, right? Um, at that point in the, in the novel. Um, but I don't know, it just reminds me of, Someone, because someone in a, in the chat said that she worked too much, like she. Um, but I feel like if she, like, this is a single mother, so raising two two daughters, so like that is the choice that she had at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and but it reminds me of like I. I don't know, like so for me, my family, like my grandmother was born in Louisiana. Uh, Minden, and mm -hmm. she also had to stop going to school to help, um, uh, like her family who were sharecroppers. So, it's like the same exact thing. And I remember, like, 
coming, like listening to my grandmother tell these stories. And I'd be like, that is so unfair. Like, how would you, like, how dare, you know, your mother or my great, my great grandmother not allow you to continue your, your education. So I feel like what we're like, what we're not really discussing is like the intersections of race and gender and what that means for motherhood. Well, race, gender, and class, because mm-hmm. all of these things mm-hmm. play a major role in um, her mothering. So I think like we just see her like working and being the mother who's like, don't date certain people because they're too dark. And then also, um, cause like that part when she's like, uh, that's Ray isn't courting, like <laughs> courting nobody or whatever. It's mm-hmm. just like, um, so like basically because all she could do was work now it like translated to her daughters. So like all they can do is work too. Um, and it's like this, um, I don't know, like a continued cycle that they tried to break. Um, so I see like up until this point, more of like a relationship with Desiree and her mother because Desiree returned. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, and I do feel like it informs, I feel like they were limited in what they were able to do when they were with their mom. So like, yeah, it's like in Desiree's relationship with Jude, like, She's fully like, live your life. Do talk, talk to me about this boy. I know you got a, you in a relationship. Don't lie to me. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> so like, I like their relationship actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, but like the relationship with Stella and Desiree and their mom just reminds me of what had to take place in the past mm-hmm. because of the dances. Exactly. So generational. Um, someone said that honestly, honestly, their mom reminds me of so many Southern black moms, just very mm-hmm. new last day because I told you to a no real connection as humans. And that um reminded me of the Alice Walker uh in search for my mother's garden that we're reading now. Mm-hmm. She, you know, she um I can't remember which essay specifically, but she does talk a lot about the black. American South, and she's exploring um, what's I'm sorry, I'm like Zora Neale Hurston's work, and you know, trying to learn more about her. So she like takes this trip to the South, and I think just the relationship between like blackness, motherhood, and then geographically in the South, it it makes for some very for a very interesting dynamic. Like, and then you know, within the context of of this, you you add this this skin tone, this weird town that they're living in, where everybody's light skin, and all these messages that they are that they're instilling in their children. It's just it's super. It's it's also very interesting to see what they take from their relationship with their mother and apply to the relationship they have with their daughters. Yeah, because they they are really they, in a way, they either reinvent or recreate some element of the relationship they had with their mom. Yeah. Um, but I still think Desiree was still kind of a cold mom only because there were so many things unsaid and I don't think she tried hard enough to be to help Drew survive in Mallory as a child. Because mm-hmm. I because like Desiree I don't think have really come to terms with how she you know, grew up in Mallory. So she's kind of like, I don't know how to help my daughter. Cause I mean, for, for one, she can't relate, <laughs> and, you know, and on, on the skin tone part, but also because she just had a lot of unresolved issues from, from growing up in that space. And like her returning, like even in her motherhood, like at, like she was still, enduring like she's not even trying to heal from trauma like she's still running away from this abusive relationship and so like these things are informing her motherhood mothering style uh going you want to go back to Mallory 
<laughs> I think, but it was like, that was what? her option. Yeah, so she, okay, okay, I was like, why did she take my daughter? But I forgot, I forgot about the, the husband that was, mm-hmm. yeah, the abusive husband, I did feel, okay. Yeah, so I just feel like, yeah, and so perhaps, and I think I'm thinking of like their conversations when she goes to college, but mm-hmm. yes, as a child, Jude and Desiree were like very like, in separate silos, but existing yeah. all the time. So, um, yeah. I was so, <laughs> this is so like <laughs> petty, but I was so annoyed when I was reading and Desiree had the husband that was beating on her. I was like, what? And this, you know, Stella had the <laughs> the nice the nice white man who was like, this baby. I was like, man, what is this? Like it, it just, I don't know why, but it just rubbed me the wrong way. I was just like, why, why they do Desiree like this? I feel like yeah. they, she was really like from the beginning of you know since that they look identical. I'm assuming they have a certain life path set laid out for them because of you know their personality, their character traits, and all that. And I just didn't, I didn't like the. the the cards that my sister Desiree was dealt and Stella, while Stella, of course, you know, she was going through it. She still, you know, she was in a relationship with this man that I guess, you know, he was, a, he seemed to be a pretty good dude. Like, well, <laughs> so it's saying, not the nice white man. <laughs> I mean, my thing is, it's, it is like, why paint this church? Like, the only, okay, so the dark skinned black man is abusive. The other, the other one is uh, like a jailbird, like went to jail and kind of traveling through life too, like in these makeshift jobs. And it's like, don't got a house of his own. So it's like, it was like, I don't want to like critique the author, but I'm critiquing the author. Like, yeah. are, there, yeah. are there some deeper issues? I was, I was feeling it. Was Cause you know, yes. like fairy movies, the dark skinned husband's always beating them, and then the light skinned man comes in. You know, the bus, the light skinned bus driver. It was, yeah. <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I feel like you know it did serve the, the a, a purpose overall. I, I'm still trying to sift through that, but I I just feel like Desiree right deserved better. <laughs> I was supposed uh, to be black and got the. <laughs> Got given the Tina Turner storyline. Stella was white, <laughs> and she got to be recently legally blind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I scared Buster. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, what do you what do you make of the twins' decision? Oh, okay, <laughs> to date and marry the men they choose, and then what do you think of Desiree's decision to marry the the dark skinned black man juxtaposed alongside her sister's decision to pass as white and marry the white man. So I don't know. Like I feel like both of them were like attempting to continue this along their story, like the storyline. So one is very interested in exploring her blackness. And so, so she marries that blackest person she can find. And then, and then one is very, uh, you know, indebted to, or like focused on continuing her storyline of whiteness. And so mm-hmm. he, in order to do that, marries a white man who will allow her to um, continue that story and like birth a new story uh, that is also white. So, I don't know. I feel like it, it to me, makes sense and that they are like these two separate individuals who are living these separate lives. And so they marry those who like uphold that narrative for them. So this, this comment, I think Desiree made a very deliberate decision to find the darkest man she could find. Do you think that, and to, with, 
on the same token with Stella, do you think that they're so since their choices, like I'm we can all agree that like their choices and the demand that they're with is are very intentional. It's just to how they, you know, want to be seen within the world. Do you think that it's like fetishy in any way on either on either end? It probably could be for both. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um I think again, like Desiree is trying to prove her blackness. And mm -hmm. so that is one of the ways that she's doing that. Um, and then uh, Stella is trying to demonstrate to the world that she's white and she can continue to pass as such. And so look how white I am. I even got a white husband. So it's <laughs> like, um, and he's wealthy as well. Like, so, you know, like, yeah, I feel like it is their acts of rebellion. It's like fetishizing as well. Um, and both of them got some things they need to work on <laughs> personally. So, yeah. Okay, are we back? Okay, okay, we still well. <laughs> okay, what happened? I'm sorry about that, y'all. Um, <laughs> it just clicked off. I was like, okay, well. Oh. Oh, my Lord, I see I'm all. Uh, where were we? You know what? We're starting. Okay. I think she's gonna pass. she's gonna be able to come back. I'm gonna try and thug it out. But um I think we were we were talking about how their husbands and their husbands husbands really there just to kind of serve as a means to an end as far as them becoming the the white woman that they well for Stella becoming the white woman that she felt like she deserved to be there there we go okay. <laughs> Can you hear me now? yeah we're good. okay we're out here okay um yeah so we're talking about love we're talking about love i think we're talking about did they love their husbands yeah I, I and i was talking about the fact that i think that it was like a form of rebellion and mm -hmm. sort of fetishizing their relationships so um i don't know 
I don't think so, but I will tell you that I do believe that she loved, uh, what is it? I can't remember his name. The uh, one that was in jail. That oh, was uh, yeah, I don't remember his name either. Yeah. But I, know so, you, I know you're talking about. But I do believe like that is her first like attempt to like really demonstrate like or show her feelings for somebody else even mm -hmm. though you know like she was awaiting his phone call she was but we also don't know the backstory well like you know like the really oh early yeah that was early so i do feel like he she loved him but wonder how stella's husband would have felt if he knew she was black. This is what I was waiting on Britt Bennett to hit us with. I was like, what is, what's his name, Blake? What's mm -hmm. Blake? Mm -hmm. did, I just, did I just give him a Blake name? was, uh, Blake was uh, the friend in, at, like in uh, California. Oh, okay. Like, he was a performer. All right. Yeah. So Stella's husband. I was wondering what he would because he you know he's such a you know oh i think i'm going too far ahead but that that the situation that ended up happening with the black couple that moved into the neighborhood um and how he kind of you know canceled stella through that at some moments so i was like okay he's uh, he's pretty he's pretty nice dude to her so i just but what if she was like well truth is i don't want those negroes here because i'm black you know what would he say if she had a, a moment and she just, she, at, towards the end when she was just telling all, you know, telling Kennedy her truth and she decided to tell her husband, um, I'm black. Well, well, he, Blake is Stella's husband. Like, we oh, got Blake. Well, I, I, got, I thought I just gave him a random white man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded right. You say, somebody said they feel like uh, Blake could have been a woke white man. <laughs> this, this might be true. Like we don't know. He might be so madly in love with Stella that he'll be like, "I'll accept you." I don't care that you're black. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, but it would have changed their whole dynamic. So <laughs> oh, somebody said he would have kicked her to the curb. <laughs> I, it's that that class element that that the fact that he has money and that he has like he's a you know he's rich it makes me think he wouldn't be so like girl you messing up you you messing you playing with my money i'm you trying, know, to, trying to like, like, yeah and it would like prevent them from going into certain spaces mm -hmm. uh, somebody said no but no black was racist Period. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what else there? Is this all in one through six? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like <laughs> the bar is so low for the white people in this story. Man, the bar is on the floor. He was like, it's okay, honey. I was like, okay. Ooh, this is a nice white man. That's okay. Okay, you want to go to the next? I think that was that was the wait. We, we just, yeah, that uh -huh. was the end of part one. Oh shoot! We got like a long. <laughs> you, oh, I remember like some other happenings in in part one. I feel like. I don't know the the pool scene was. But black and white is way to segregate. Yeah, yeah, black. You know, I think because he uh, was a nice husband. I keep forget, like in my mind, still black, and I keep forgetting that he thought he was married to a white woman. So all the little things that he was doing, I'm like, see, he's a cool. He was, he was nice to her. But, you know, white black somebody white people. That's not what we talk about. What white people do, but yes, white people love to sue. So he probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are so we are we gonna do part two? We're doing one and two. Oh, we are. Mm -hmm. One through six chapters. One through six. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm confused. 
part one, two. Uh, oh, okay, okay, go ahead then. Okay. I, I was confused. It's fine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> okay, so part two uh, is called Max. It takes place in 1978. A uh, Jew's experience with colorism is marked by comparisons to her mother and file name calling in the small town of Mallard, which we kind of talked about. Um, consider your personal experiences with colorism. How have you experienced and or perpetuated harmful biases rooted in skin tone discrimination towards dark skinned individuals? Consider this in tandem with your gender identity. And then it asks, why does Jew decide to attend UCLA? And what is her relationship with Mallard after leaving her college? Um, hmm. Maybe a personal experience as a color. I think that like, so I, I grew up in the South. I still live in the South. Um, I feel like I'm stuck in the South. So, I, but it's interesting because I think I've been on, I, well, I've definitely been on both ends. Um, because I am like darker, but I have friends that are much darker than me. So they have experience. Like I have friends who have, who, who heard the, um, like one of my friends was called Tar Baby in school. And I was like, girl, what? Like in, like in 2015, 2016 it was called Tar Baby. <laughs> and I was like, wow. well, okay. And of course, I, like I've heard a little like you know, pretty for dark skinned girl comments, you know that that type of thing. Um, I you know just thinking back and remembering certain comments from family about oh you can wear this shade, you can wear this, don't wear this, it doesn't look good on your skin tone. Even if they weren't talking to me, you know I've heard it. Yeah, I don't think that my experiences with colorism have been far as violent and just heinous as, like I said, some of my darker skin friends. I'm kind of, I would say like in that, that, that middle ground, you know, I hear comments, but I feel like there are dark skinned black women who have really, who really bear the, the brunt of, of colorism. Yeah. And like, for me, like, again, like I know that colorism exists. I know that um, for, well, within communities of Black folk, like for me to be light skin is a privilege because um, in certain aspects. So like to, like often until I open my mouth, uh, <laughs> like I am assumed to be like the safe Black girl, right? The light skinned Black girl who's safe, who's non-threatening, um, and so there's that. And then I know like in Detroit, like there, there used to be parties where light skinned girls got in for free. So, yeah. Uh, and that, that's not that long ago. That was probably like 10 years ago. Like, so we got some things we need to work. I mean, colorism is real. It's still here in public and like, you know, it is deeply connected to gender, you know, like, so, and, but don't give me, like, I also feel like uh, I experienced certain things uh, growing up in Detroit because it's like predominantly, like it was like even now, like 80% African-American. Mm -hmm. like and so like, my mom is Italian and, or was Italian and black. And so mm -hmm. like, my hair when I was younger was curly and things like 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 <laughs> the girls mm -hmm. in the uh, book probably um, and like I was talked about like for that or talking white you should talk like a white girl your hair is like a white girl like where mm -hmm. please tell me where a white girl here look like this curly the curly hair like no I don't think so yeah uh, but. Yeah, so like it's like a complex, like it's a complex relationship with color or skin tone. But I, I mean, I've like I used to date like an ex was 
extremely dark skin and like we couldn't go certain places and be served without him being stared at mm -hmm. or questioned weirdly. There were times where, and this is like recent. So like, <laughs> like times where like they like wouldn't even approach him. They would talk to me first. So like, that's that whole, like, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. I'm not threatening. Right. Until I start going off or something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> when I got to, when I got to college, um, onto a PWI. And I think that, like that, the cold switching thing. I just, I can't really. I don't really do it well. I saw somebody say online they was a talent today, and I was like, okay, well, I'm not very talented in that area because I remember trying sometimes, and because I already have this very, I have this disappearance. Like I pretty much always wear my hair in this puff, and then I remember, like I thought I was, I thought I put on my best, like Sarah Payton voices this one time. I was like, I thought I just did it. And so I said, oh, where are you, are you from the South? And I was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm just going to be as Black and as Southern. And I'm just going to, every time I tell y'all, I'm just going to hear T.I. Because you said T.I. <laughs> it's, it's all going to there together. I just feel like my, I think I really tried to play it up because my my skin tone, I was really, I, when I, once I got to that school, I started to be more aware of um, my skin tone. There were quite a few light, light skinned girls. That I was in spaces with, and I didn't at at home in high school. I had guys, my um, guys who were my skin tone who wouldn't date me, and I didn't realize it until honestly, like re recently, that it was it was a skin color thing because they wouldn't they, they didn't like me or they liked me but they didn't like this or they didn't like you know they didn't like this about me and realizing now that it was a it was a skin tone thing seeing you know the girls that they did decide to pursue or seeing just the way that they saw me i was seen as like the homeboy almost so it was it's just like these little those little things that honestly then i was not super aware of i was just kind of like uh you know my feelings might have been hurt might have been annoyed by it but now looking back, I'm like, oh, that's that's what that was. Yeah. Even if they weren't actively, you know, making decisions based on it, you know, it was it's just that subconscious kind of thing that you know we're, we're taught growing up. Somebody want to hear your Sarah? Well, several people want to hear your Sarah Palin voice. Girl, she did. I don't know where she. <laughs> <laughs> she said she did. I'm good that when we talk about. Uh, in search of our mother's garden. <laughs> I'll put on put it on now. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't I mean I it still exists. Colorism, I did I just it it just is. It's real, it's everywhere. Um there are differences um and treatment. Um and like like I know for a fact there are spaces I'm allowed to enter because of my skin tone yeah. and other people will never be able to like sit at the table. And you know, yeah. another thing I hate is when the conversation on colorism just revolves around dating. People are like, oh, you didn't get, mm -hmm. you didn't get, you didn't get chose by the dude. It's not cause he was dark skin. It's cause it, for what, like, I, I really hate how we don't talk enough about you know, we talk about systemic racism. We don't talk about the ways that colorism plays out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through, through these exact same systems, I it, it's always, oh, it always boils down to that whole dating preference conversation. And I feel like mm -hmm. that's so dishonest and... Well, and it's still systemic racism is internalized and it shows up in these different spaces um, and within our family. So not just like, dating relationships, but it plays a role in the jobs we get. Exactly. Um, and I think somebody mentioned like earlier um, Lovecraft Country, like I keep thinking of that in mm -hmm. color. And the two sisters in there. I did, really. Light skin, dark skin, right? Yeah. Um, so, and ge again, gender plays a huge role. Um, and so, but I also think like, so when I, when I personally enter into a space, 
at, again, I, I'm like, people think it's like code switching, but it's just like, actually, I'm just like, all of these things are me. So like, yeah. I can talk about theory all day with you, mm -hmm. but I can really tell you, like, I'm from the street and I will like, <laughs> like right? Like, it's, I don't know. It's not really switching. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. who I am. And it's like, it doesn't, one doesn't go away. Like, I can't. Um, but I don't know, like, it's, it's very interesting. It, it's so, I mean, even in my own, again, in my own family. So like my stepmother is dark skin and she always talks about like the circumstances, um, in her own, like among her sisters, she's the darkest one and like how she couldn't even go, you know, like, and still probably wouldn't be able, wouldn't feel comfortable visiting some family in Atlanta because of their, their, the same mentality. Uh, so, and hair as well, like her, like the other, her sister's hair is like wavy. Hers is um, like a different, a different texture. Um, and she wears it in twists, her sister wore it in like curly. So it's like a, um, it's a difference and it still exists. Mm -hmm. uh, Someone um, asked, do you think we should teach our kids to code switch? She did quite try. She wouldn't learn from me. But uh, for, um, I don't, I don't. I mean, I think, I, I almost feel like it's like a natural thing that happens. Like, I don't think it's something that we have, like, learned, we picked up, like, evolution to kind of, like, navigate this world. But if you even think about it, like, our ancestors code switched, mm -hmm. like, to survive, um, and now we just have a term for it. <laughs> so I, I think the conversation on it is also changing because, like, when you look at it in the context of what you brought up, like, I, I saw a clip today from uh, the show Big Mouth where they, like, on Netflix, I don't know if you've seen it, but they had, I, it's, they have a song and they were talking about code switching. And I think it's, it's kind of odd to me how now code switching is, like, this big like celebratory thing and it's like, oh, it's a skill that we have. And I, I understand trying to ce celebrating the things that we have used to resist, but it has, it's taken on this, this, it's like we, we water down our blackness and we celebrate the ability to do so in the, in the present day conversations that I, mm -hmm. that I see. It's like, look at me, I can sound like a white woman and then I can turn it off and I can sound like, oh, there goes the therapy. You just did it. <laughs> <laughs> it is the way the comment, the way the conversation is framed is weird. Like I understand why people do it. Like it's, like it's, I'm, you know, I don't think any of us are are beloved. Like it's how we get through our work day. It's how we get these jobs. But now it's like, look at you, code switching. You're so amazing. It's such a Put that on your resume that you can code switch. So it's just kind of it's odd the way we we approach it to me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Like I just I don't feel like we should have to. So I don't feel like because you're you're right, like like we've used this to this point as a method of survival, but thriving means that we don't have to. So when do we get to a point where we're thriving and we're here? And we're embraced for all of everything that we are. Like, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, like I do have, like there are colleagues that I have, actually one that I actually really consider a friend, not just a colleague, mm -hmm. who is a white woman. And like, I don't have to pretend around her. Mm -hmm. So. If like our relationships were truly authentic, we wouldn't have to be like use this voice or behaviors that are in particular way. Like, and it's threat. It is threatening. And sometimes, like for me, like I <laughs> enjoy just like being whoever I am. Like, you know, like the person that I am authentically. And if you don't like it, you just don't like it. Yeah. You shouldn't hire me then. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, it reminds me, like, I remember now thinking back, I, someone brought it up about their mom's white woman voice. Like, I remember, like, getting in trouble at school, and my mama would, like, be talking to me, going off, 
sounded like me. And then she was going to phone my teacher. And I was like, ma'am, <laughs> who are you? Like two completely different voices. And she would just be going back and forth just like mm -hmm. that. And when I get off this phone, yes, excuse me. I'm sorry. What are we going to do today? And I was just like, it's, it's it's crazy, but it's so like, but you see that and you're like, okay, you pick up on those little cues and before you know it, you're doing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I never saw that movie, but yeah, I've seen some clips. And <laughs> to what extent does learning and code switching at a young age lead to, lead to an inferiority complex or imposter syndrome? Well, I think it's deeply connected to it because mm -hmm. it's that like our authentic and what is our authentic self? Like if we're always code switching, like how do we, <laughs> you know, like yeah, it's like hiding who we are, like and maybe who we are is like the, exists in complexity, you know, like we're just these dynamic beings who um Yes, we're educated, but we can be educated or well read or, uh, you know, community based educated, you know, like not necessarily like ivory tower uh, yeah. type thing, but like, and just be, and it's fine. So I do believe it leads to, it does an internalized kind of hatred of our authentic selves. It prevents us from actually like exploring who we are authentically. Mm -hmm. um, we're always questioning ourselves. Did I say that correctly? You know, <laughs> in this meeting, right, right. I was trying to, I was trying to emulate your Sarah Palin voice. It didn't work. You can't do it. Like me. You can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I don't okay. If we are 100% raw ourselves in white spaces, we're less likely to be taken seriously, and as we appear to be less, in, as we appear to be less in comparison to our white counterparts, it's levels to being real. Someone gave me that golden nugget today. Interesting. I think I just um, I dealt with so much imposter syndrome in college because I just really did not understand why I was there, <laughs> why I got in. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, trying to like fit into the, the the mold and make sure, you know, I was able to have certain conversations and sound a certain way. After a while, it, it was just exhausting and it just, it, it felt dishonest. And I was just like, these are the, the parts of me. And I, especially cause I, when I started, I was an engineer. So I was already lying cause I thought I was gonna be an engineer. And once I was like, look, that's not me. I don't talk like this. This is how I look. This is, you know, the, this is my full package. That's when I was really able to just exist and go on about my way and work out the other stuff. <laughs> Cause you know, I was, I wasn't trying to battle with, you know, who I was going to sound like today or, you know, any of those kind of arbitrary things. Yeah. And I, so I feel like it's actually like code switching is, uh, another way of saying, uh, like, one of the mechanisms to uphold, like, respectability politics that Absolutely. we, yeah, so it's just, like, I don't know, like, so I think I used to try to appease people, but I, I like, learned, like, for example, in the position I'm in right now, like, as soon as I, like, started, I, I thought I had to behave a certain way. It didn't matter how I behaved. It didn't matter how I spoke, like they were still disrespectful. Yeah. I was still caught aggressive and angry. Uh, and it didn't matter. Like you didn't know me from any like anybody. Mm -hmm. So so it didn't matter. And so like to me, it now has become easier just to be who I am. Like if you don't like the way that I'm talking, if you don't welcome me into this space, then I'm gonna create my own space. Like, yeah. I think it is important for me right now, like as a, a like I create op, like mentoring opportunities for undergraduate women of color. And mm -hmm. like I thought this all the time, like it is dangerous to not be able to belong, especially to your own self, like to be authentic within your own self. 
and to like always have to be switching back and forth. <laughs> like, this comment right here reminds me of what you were saying during our, I think our last live chat. Um, so someone said we still have to teach our black children to survive in certain aspects of their lives. And unfortunately that includes code switching in some circumstances, but it reminds me when you said, you said something about surviving versus thriving. And I don't, I think of, you know, when I'm close to twitching, I'm, I'm, you know, that's survival. But now that I'm like, I can't do it, I'm not going to do it. I, that's that's the space where I have been able to thrive. Because again, like I'm not, my identity is not what I'm, and, and how you are perceiving that is, that's not my business. Like you're going, you're going to, like you say, you're going to, you're going to feel how you feel, but you also, you're going to get what you get. So, yeah. So to me, it's like teaching, and I understand like the world we live in, and in certain places and institutions are dangerous for mm -hmm. black, like black and brown young people, right? Like, because we can like mess around, like we can say the wrong thing one day and not be here the next. Yeah. Um, because somebody is not appreciating the, our tone or something. Mm -hmm. And so I understand that, but at the same time, it's like teaching, teaching others that like teaching ourselves and those who come after us that like, we just have to assimilate to survive again, like yeah. to survive instead of like dealing with the, like the root of the issue because right. the issue is like the fact that we ha even have to code switch in the first place right. so like, <laughs> like that are like that again the authentic self is not welcome into this space yeah so. and, that, and i think that us like celebrating it is this like you know diverse thing is really is it's us not pushing ourselves to question why we have to do it in the first place you know yeah. it's just existing within that the, the comfort of it, you know, just being okay with it, just being how it is. Yeah. Uh, we went all of our time. Uh, when did we get to the last question? <sighs> this was good, though. I like this. Huh? I said, this was good, though. I like this. Yeah. I mean, one, two, three. I wanted to talk about that last question. Okay, okay. You want about Jude deciding to attend UCLA? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, the last, the one um, about Jude being transgender and how does that connect to like race? Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I can't. Yeah. Um, so it says, uh, Reese Carter, Jude's best friend, <laughs> who becomes more than the best friend, mm -hmm. at UCLA is a transgender man from Arkansas who ran away from home, fleeing an abusive father to live life on his own terms in LA. Jude shares more about her experience with colorism with Reese and their relationship begins to blossom romantically. What do you presume is the purpose and impact of Reese not having to engage in a typical coming out conversation with Jude in regards to his trans identity. What does Reese's trans identity add to the story as a whole? Um, what does this relationship dynamic offer to the story of Stella and Desiree? Consider Reese and Jude's relationship alongside the other romantic relationships in the novel. How does identity contribute to the foundation of their relationship? Um. I, I I really I appreciated that that Reese didn't have this I'm you know grand coming out moment that was a big point of contention or conversation in the story. Um, I think it just for one it made me like Jude even more because you know I was like I was like okay clearly like Reese is comfortable enough to like almost immediately disclose this information to Jude. And it really kind of let me know that they were going to have somewhat of a, you know, a healthy relationship. But it was also like, you know, I think kind of the point that Bennett may have been getting at is that they have these, they both have these very rough childhood experiences or they come from just some very kind of turbulent backgrounds. And they're, they have met each other and now that's that's no longer 
at the center of who they are, what they are, what they're striving for. They kind of, um, you know, they both have these these traumas. Whereas I don't know if Reese was Reese. The Reese was their father. Was his father abusive because he was trans, or was he just like was he abusive to him because oh you're you're trans, or was he just a, an abusive man? No, he was abusive because he saw Reese like um like it was a a young girl and they were together and he saw them together. Okay. And, and like he stayed home from school one day and the girl came over and like all this stuff. And so I think that I mean it was connected to you know an early um trans identity um so yeah yeah he was kissing i guess a, a classmate or it, it didn't i don't think it's specified classmate but mm -hmm. another girl yeah what did you what did you think about their relationship though ruth and recent just their their whole dynamic on all, all these questions uh, it was a lot of questions. Uh, I actually, uh, I think one of the things I got from um, Reese's and Jude's relationship was um, the creation of home, like a new home mm -hmm. and a new sense of belonging that comes with chosen family and community. Um, and I don't think that home would have existed in Arkansas, where Reese was from, or yeah. in Louisiana, obviously, where Jude moved to. Mm -hmm. um, but it did, it was able to exist in California, which is known for being more progressive and open. So um, I think it was like extremely um, interesting since it was happening in the 70s too. And we tend to see like trans identity um and top surgery and things like that as like this new thing and so it demonstrates that i mean even though i guess it's not historical fiction so we don't know if this was actually happening but i'm sure like there were those trying to get top surgery and taking um hormone treatments and stuff like that then mm -hmm. so to me it's just like i appreciate it um, the the relationship and yes like I, I think that Jude was so accepting and willing to work this extra job or this new job to just to to help Reese be comfortable comfortable in their body and be comfortable um, as the person that they they are and so that doesn't happen often and so like mm -hmm. even though they had to go further away to do that, across, you know, across the states for that to happen, it happened. And community, so going back to that other question about home and belonging, like it can happen when you find your people, like the people who accept you 100% for who you are. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was just happy to see it, like see them, like again, especially if something's taking, a, taking place in the 70s, like that, like, and we're often told, like, you know, those in the Black community are not uh, accepting of trans folk. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so this was like a counter narrative, like talking back to that that whole idea. Um, so I actually that was probably like the most. <laughs> I enjoyed that part of the book. And the other part, like, it just reminded me of, like, my own family. Part of my family trying to pass, and then the other part, oh, yeah. you know, like, part, like, my aunt still passing, living a whole life. Really? As a white woman with white kids. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, so I, I appreciated it. Wow. Yeah, somebody said I appreciate the merging of blackness and sexuality and how black people as a whole have struggled with both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that this that chapter or that section was like a very important section to like feature in the book. And so mm -hmm. I'm glad that it's there. Yeah, I think they um they have the strongest, healthiest relationship <laughs> through and throughout the whole the whole book. Um yeah. and I uh, think as far as the question, what does this relationship dynamic offer to the story of Della? Stella and Desiree. Um, when you just consider those, like Stella and Desiree, and then the relationship they have with their daughters, and then even um, what's uh, Stella's daughter's name? Kennedy. The relationship that she eventually, the like romance relationship she eventually has, it's just like everybody's messed up. But then you come over here to these people, Reese and Jewel, who are, you know, who would generally be seen as the outcasts who are othered and because of um, gender identity and race. And they, this is where the, the healthiest relationship lies. And perhaps it's because they have endured all of this mess, like mm -hmm. on, you know, like in their separate worlds that they were able to come together. And they're so accepting of other people mm -hmm. you know, like, who are part of their worlds as well. Yeah. So, um, it's like we've endured so much. Like, how dare we like be hateful towards each other? Right. Exactly. Right. So, yeah, it was like a point of liberation, like within mm -hmm. their relationship, but also like again, like the creation of a new community, which actually is the case for so many um, folks in the LGBTQ community. So, yeah. Chosen family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's the last question, I think. Is that that's all we got? Sorry for going over, y'all. Get off here before restream kick us off again. <laughs> but this was this this is good. I enjoyed this a lot. Thank y'all for joining us. Um, check out the next one is coming up on the thirteenth. Yes, okay. at seven. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank okay. you. Everyone. <laughs> and we will see y'all next time. Y'all have a good evening.